So I'm going to ask you all if you have your Bibles with you to turn with me to Genesis, I'm not Genesis, to Matthew 24, verses 1, 2, and 3. And you know what? The, the question about end times, about the end of days, is not a new question. It's something that has been asked since the beginning of time. In fact, Adam and Eve were expecting the coming of Messiah as well. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all and, and eagerly awaiting the coming of Messiah. Moses was expecting the coming of Messiah. Um, Paul was expecting the coming of Messiah. And even the disciples asked Jesus when, when he was returning. If you turn with me to Je Matthew 24, verses 1 through 3, it reads, Jesus left the temple and was going away. And if I may, if I, if I, if I, if I may ask many of you, if you can mute your lines, please. So Matthew 24, verses 1, 2, and 3 reads, Jesus left the temple and was going away. When his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, but he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So do you see what Jesus is saying here? And this is very appropriate for the season that we're in right now because we, we are entering to a, three, a period of three weeks of, of mourning. And these three weeks are a period of time from the 17th day of the Hebrew month of Tammuz to the ninth day of the month of Av. Don't worry about what that means right now. But these three weeks are a period in Jewish history where countless calamities have hit the Jewish people. For example... The, the, right now in the Hebrew calendar, we are in the fourth month. Of course, in, in our Western calendar, July, J July is the seventh month of the solar calendar and the way we count the months. On the Hebrew calendar, it, which, which is based upon the, on, on the cycles of the moon, it's a lunar calendar, and we are in the fourth month of the Hebrew calendar. So this month is Tammuz. And if you want to say that with me, please say it with me. It, we, we are in the month of Tammuz. We're in the month of Tammuz. Awesome. And the seventeenth day of the month is, is a day in which many trage tragedies have occurred to the Jewish people. For example, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the first set of Ten Commandments, what were the Israelites doing? They had they had set up a golden calf and they they were worship, they were dancing and worshiping the golden calf. And, and at that instant, Moses threw down the Ten Commandments to the ground, shattered the two tablets in, in, into millions of pieces. And, and that was the first recorded tragedy in the Bible of what occurred on the first 17 of Thomas. Well, guess what? Other calamities have occurred on that date as well. For example, um, the, the walls of the city of Jerusalem during the first temple period w w was breached on each 17 of Thomas. Also, on another 17th of Tammuz in 70 AD, either 69 or 70 AD, the Romans had, had breached the walls of the city of Jerusalem as well on the very same day, the, seventh, the, the 17th of Tammuz. Then if you scroll forward three weeks, we come to the day known as the ninth, of, the ninth day of the fifth month, the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av. Can you say that with me? The ninth of Av. Ninth, ninth of Av. And if you say that all in Hebrew, it's Tisha Bav. And on, so on Tisha B'Av, the first temple was destroyed, the second temple was destroyed, and guess what? Ten of the twelve spies returned from Canaan to Moses with an evil report of the land. And because of that sin, the Israelites had to dwell in the wilderness for, four, for 40 years. Instead of entering the land immediately, they had to wait 40 years because of that sin, because they spoke evil of the land of Israel and because they instill fear in all the hearts of the Israelites. So these three weeks, as you can see, are, are times of, count, of calamities that occurred. I'll give you other examples that have happened. World War I started as a result of, uh, 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 during this three week period. The Nazi par party in Germany rose to power in this period. The Jews were expelled from England during this three week period. The Jews were exiled from Spain during this three week period. So because of all these calamities, what you'll find the Jews doing during this period of time is that, that these are three weeks of mourning and fasting for the Jewish people. And they're, and they're asking God, don't let these calamities ever occur again for the Jewish people. Amen. And that should be our prayer as well, that, that, 
this be a period of time that we set aside for prayer, for fasting, and for intercession. And it's my prayer that we all take this time to pray for, for the end of this COVID pandemic. I mean, how many of you are Amen. ready to see this calamity come to an end? Amen. I don't. Uh, I think. I think we all we all have our both arms in the air and our legs in the air too. We're we're, we're so done with this. And what's funny is there have been so many people that are saying that this calamity will come to an end on this date, but they, they've all been wrong. And we we it's going to end when God says it ends. But I, but I I really believe this. God. I mean, what the enemy uses for harm, God's going to turn around for good. And God is Amen. calling His body to repentance. God is calling His body to return to Him. And God is calling us to fast and pray like never before. Amen? Amen. So coming back to Matthew 24, verses 1 through 3, Jesus left the temple and was going away. You know, Jesus is the glory of God. Amen? Jesus is God the Son. He's just as much God as God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. But at, when he walked on the earth as a man, he put, he, he put his deity, he did not, he never stopped being God. Yet, he did not use his power as God to do the miracles that he did. The miracles that he performed, he, he performed through his relationship with God the Father and yielding to the, to the Holy Spirit. Because he, he lays down the blueprint for us to walk in it with God and to walk in the realm of miracles, of power, of healing, of deliverance, and that we can live Acts 10, 38, that we can go about doing good and healing all that are oppressed of the devil and to heal the sick. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So when the when the glory leaves, that's when calamity hits. Mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar could not attack Jerusalem until the glory of God departed, because as long as the glory is present, the enemy cannot harm you. And that's why it's my prayer that Lord, please do not take your Holy Spirit from us. Mm -hmm. And when the Holy Spirit leaves, take us with with, with Him. Because we, we, do not, we never want to be separated from God's Amen. glory. And when, so yeah. when we look at the verse here in Matthew 24, Jesus left the temple. So it's in a sense, the glory, he's prophesying the leaving of, 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 of the glory. And then look, look what Jesus says. Jesus says, you see all these things, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now, I want you to imagine the shock with the disciples when they hear their Messiah say this. When they see Jesus say, there will not be left one stone upon another. I mean, can you imagine something coming of, of that magnitude coming to fruition? This magnificent structure, this beautiful city, these beautiful walls, this, uh, this, this, uh, this amazing temple, that it's all going to come down to the point where there will not be one stone left upon another. Jesus' prophecy was fulfilled exactly in 70 AD during the three-week period of mourning. And what took place is the, the, the Romans burned the entire city down to the ground, and they broke every stone that there was not one stone left upon another. And the reason is the Romans knew that the, that the Jewish priests would hide uh, valuable gold and jewelry and, and valuable things within the stones. They were like, almost like they were baked into the stones. So that's why they broke every stone to, 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 to discover those treasures. So Je when Jesus prophesies, pay attention because his prophecies will come true exactly. I mean, to the dotting of every T, to the, I mean, to the, sorry, to the crossing of every T, to the dotting of every I, his prophecies come to, into fruition 100%. Mm -hmm. And then in verse three, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, this is the very same place that he will return to in his second coming. The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will this be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? Now, just before that, Jesus talks about the destruction of the temple. And then in the next verse, the disciples ask him, when will the end of the world take place? These two scriptures don't really seem to connect with each other. But then that's why we need to understand the mindset of the Jews in the first century. And their mindset was, not just the first century, but, but, but for, for the Jews throughout the ages, even back to the first temple period, when there is no, the, 
when there is no temple present, it is as if the world has ended. Because without the temple, there is no animal sacrifice. Without the temple, there is no, there is no service to God. Without the temple, there is no glory. So when there's no glory, it's the equivalent of the end of the world. And I want you to imagine your life as Christians, for those of you on the line that are, that are Christians, how, I mean, to not have the Holy Spirit in, in, dwelling inside of you is the equivalent of the end of the world for us. Because where would we be without God's Amen. presence? I'm telling you that God's presence should be more important to us than anything. Amen? Amen. So, 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 and my goal tonight is to bring you to that place of loving God's temple. And you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, you're, and your, your greatest desire it would be is to allow the Spirit of God to reign inside of our beings. Amen? To allow the Holy Spirit to have his way, to allow him to use our senses, allow him to use us when he wants to use us in prayer, in intercession, in healing, in deliverance, that we are obedient to the Holy Spirit. If he wants to wake you up at three in the morning to pray, then you just yield to the Holy Spirit and allow him to use you as a vessel. Amen. So, and this Amen. question, this question that the disciples ask him, what is the sign of your coming? What is the sign of the end of days? See, this concept of end of days, I don't know if this concept exists in other faiths, but this is a very key question that we, in, in our faith as Christians and, 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 and as Jews, the question is, when will the end of days take place? Now, one of my biggest mm -hmm. passions ever since I became a Christian, probably around the age of 11, 12 years old, is I, I, have, I have just been really drawn to biblical prophecy and of end time events. I mean, I listened to every single teacher I could listen to on, on television about end time events. And I listened to three, four different teachers on prophecy and they'd all contradict each other. And it left me so confused. And I was trying to figure out, well, when is this event gonna take place and what's the timing of this event? And it, and it, was, it, was, such, it was so frustrating, but you know what? God wants us to, God want, at times, God wants us to be frustrated because he wants us to seek out the scriptures. Amen. Because yes. I'm telling you, this is the most fascinating topic. Now, I don't believe there's any person that has it completely right. Because you know one thing about biblical prophecy? We don't know it until it's already com come to pass. And once mm -hmm. it's come to pass, then we can put everything together in, in, in it perfectly. So even as I'm teaching you the next, next several weeks, and my goal is to take you through 22 chapters of Revelation, even before I have the answers. But, it, it, but through this journey, I want to take you through a journey of 22 chapters of Messianic miracles and, 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 and to teach you, th to the best of my ability, through the help of the Holy Spirit, to help you understand that the days that we are living in. COVID-19... Uh, should not be a surprise. I mean, that this is just one of one of, one of the <laughs> calamities that have hit the earth. Amen. But I encourage you all: do not, do Amen. not, do not walk in fear. Do not live in fear. You may initially no. be afraid. Amen. But, but I encourage you: allow this to draw you closer to God, because the world is going to be oh, yeah. coming to you for question for answers. And I'm telling mm -hmm. you, God is going to give you the answers, because God will not do Amen. anything Amen. revealing His secrets to His servants, the prophets. Amen. Amen. So we are we are living in the end of times. We are living in the very last in in the end of days. Mm -hmm. Messiah, the rapture is going to come very soon. Uh, yeah. Jesus is going to return very soon. The, the Antichrist is going to be revealed in his full strength very soon. All the technology in the world is in place already for for, for every human being to receive the mark of the beast. I mean, every, every, mm -hmm. everything's already here in place. I do not think there is one thing missing that's preventing the coming of Messiah. And, and, and I believe we are the generation that's gonna see the coming of Messiah. Yes, and, yes, um, amen. And it's amen. So, amen. And it's so good to see Christians actually asking questions about end times. Because I think for a while <laughs> we've, yep. we've been kind of silent, but I think where the body of Christ is arising and they're asking questions, when is he coming? Now the first thing I wanna tell you it, with that question is, if anybody tells you a date, just dismiss it and even dismiss the person that, that gave that word because nobody knows when he's coming. But all I know That's is that right. everything's already in place for his coming. Now, when I wrote the blog for, for this, this service, 
And um, I'm going to ask Sister Jamila, if you wouldn't mind posting the link to the, to the blog, um, as, as, as well as all the different ways that uh, our, our, everyone here can, 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 can connect with us. And what I wrote in the blog is, I asked the question, what is the sign of the end of days? And we're going to address this contentious topic in our series called The End of Days. So I want you all to embrace yourselves for this fascinating study. I'm going to use so many different sources over the next several weeks. I'm going to use the Torah. And when I say Torah, I'm referring to the first five books of the Bible. I'm going to use the, word, I'm going to use the prophets, which in Hebrew is Nevi'im, which are the books of prophecy in the Hebrew scriptures. For example, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, and, 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 and the, the 12 minor prophets. We're going to use the prophets. We're going to use the Talmud. Tal and I'll, I'll explain in, in another class what the Talmud is. Um, just know the Talmud is a Jewish document over 1,700 years old. We're going to use the Gospels, especially the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we're going to use the Book of Revelation. So I encourage you all to brace yourselves. This is not going to be a, a, a very easy Bible study. I, I'm going to encourage all of you to take what I share with you and, and, and to just start seeking God and to ask God questions. Because I'm telling you, this is going to be the most awesome study ever. And it's the first time I'm delivering a message to you where I don't know what I'm going to share with you next week. I am completely <laughs> trusting divine providence to lead us. And yes. I don't have all the answers, but, but I'm just really exciting to, to get out of my comfort zone as well and go on this journey with you. And you know what? The Holy Spirit will not disapp disappoint because this is not my class. This is his class. <laughs> This yes. is he's totally in control. And every one of you that's here on the line tonight, you're here by divine providence. I'm just so excited to have you all on tonight. One thing I'm going to ask you all, if you wouldn't mind, um, if you, if, for those of you that want to receive my weekly newsletters, um, and I'm not going to try and sell you anything other than I might just give you a link to buy my book. But that's totally optional. There's no pressure whatsoever. But if you'd like to receive my weekly newsletters and, and invitations, just, just if you just leave me your email address, and um, I'll, you know, I'll, 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 and then I'll collect all of those and I'll send out the weekly letters to you. I send them out to you from, from um, evite.com, I believe. So I'll shoot those out on a, on a weekly basis, once or twice per week. And so it'll just, it'll help you stay connected and I'll share all the resources that I, th th that we have. And I also want to take a moment to thank Dr. Michelle Corral. I'm under her mantle, so I just want to thank you. I just, I'm, I'm so grateful, yeah. to Dr. Michelle Corral, that she allows us to have this class. So I don't do this on my own. I'm, I'm doing this under her pastoral leadership, and I'm just so grateful to Dr. Corral for this opportunity Man. and for all of us to live together. Amen. Yeah. So the 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 first thing I want to talk talk to you about, and I'm going to say many first things because there's just so much I want to share with you, all, is about the Book of Revelation. I'm going to ask you to turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. And this is Jesus speaking to John. Because God, get, Jesus gave John this revelation while he was imprisoned on the island of Patmos for, for, for his faith. And, and John was a very elderly, elderly man at this time. John was called John the Beloved. And this is what it reads. Write the things which thou hast seen. And the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. See, we always look at the book of Revelation as if it's a book of only about end times. And if you approach Revelation from that mindset, through those lenses, it, it, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be very confused when you read the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is, not, is, a, is, is a book about what was, a book about what which is, and it's a book about what is to come. Amen. I want you to see the book of Revelation as a book that's delivered from heaven's perspective. And God is not limited by time. I should have called this teaching. That's back, right. Amen. I should have called this teaching back to the future. Because if you travel back and forward in time, to all events of time, because God knows the end. God knows everything. Amen. So I just want you to know that. So I just want you to be so. Praise God. Amen. So, so I just want you to be. I just want you to be so excited about 
I want you to be so excited about this book because you're seeing things from heaven's perspective and how God is in control of all events. And you're seeing things from, mm -hmm. from, from, from God's perspective. And it's, it's just so glorious to, to see what's taking place. So God tells John, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. It's about all of time. So when you read the Revelation, if you're trying to read the book of Revelation in chronological order, it's going to be very difficult. Because how can we align time in heaven with time on earth? It's almost it's, it's impossible for us to do. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna whet your appetite with that. We're gonna come back to Revelation in a future teaching, but uh, this nugget should help you when you read the book of Revelation. The Revelation is about all time, and you're seeing all of creation from heaven's perspective. Now, the next thing I want to share with you is the Torah is not just history; it's prophecy. Now, there are many definitions for Torah. Um, but the definition I want to give, I want to use now is the, is the literal definition of Torah. Torah in English translates to as English. And whenever we read Torah, we're referring to the first five books of the Bible. So whether you're Jewish or Christian, the first five books of, of the Bible is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the author of these five books is Moses. In our, in our Christian Bibles, the first five books are called the Pentateuch. Which is, the Greek, which is the Greek word for, for the five. And, and the, the, the Hebrew equivalent would be the word humash, which also means the five. And the Jews also call the first five books the Torah, which means instruction. And so the Torah, the first five books of the Bible are not just history, They're, they are prophecy. So when you, when you read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you're not just reading about events that took place in the past, you're reading about some things that are going to repeat in the future. And they'll repeat over and over and over again. Some things will repeat in every generation. So let's go to Genesis 25, verse 8 and 9. Genesis 25, verse 8 and 9. And it reads, Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age. An old man and full of years and was gathered to his people. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, east of Mamre. And one thing I want you to see here is, as, a, as, a, as, as, he, as he breathed his last, and he died in a good old age, I want you to know who who buried him? Who buried Abraham? It was his two sons, both Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac is mentioned first, and then Ishmael is mentioned. See, when we read this, we don't really think of this being something that we, that we really need to pay attention to. We just think of this as history. So his two sons honored him and gave him the proper burial, which is a wonderful thing. They did the right thing. But there's something more taking place here. Because all, remember I told you the Torah is not just history, it's prophecy. Mm -hmm. So there's a prophecy taking place here. The prophecy is that we're going to see Isaac and Ishmael again. And what the rabbis teach us, the rabbis teach us there's a prophecy in this. And, it's, and, the, and they tell us in the end of days, in the end of time, Isaac and Ishmael will, will, will reconcile. Isaac represents Israel, all the Jewish people. Ishmael represents the Arabs. You know, right now we see this, we, we, we see this Middle East conflict. We see Israel surrounded by the Arab nations, and we see, we see the turmoil that's taken place in the Middle East. But I want you to know is in the end, it, 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 that there will be a, a repentance by Ishmael. And, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the, there will be a uniting. And I, and I just want you to know, everything we read is prophecy. Does that make sense? Yes. And don't worry, I'm not going to get into the Middle East conflict. That, that's, 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 that's way beyond uh, my capacity to, to teach right now. But, but, I, but I'm going to teach everything to you from a, from a prophetic sense. 
Now let's look at another scripture, another, another prophecy. Genesis chapter 45, verse 4 and 14. And this is after mm-hmm. Joseph reunites with his brothers and reveals to his brothers in Egypt that I am, Joseph, I am Joseph, your brother, the one that you sold into slavery. And so Joseph says to his brothers, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And if I may ask all of you, if you wouldn't mind, if you just uh, mute your lines, please. And, and I'll, I'll read it again. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And then verse 14 says, then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. Now we think this is so wonderful, isn't it? That look, the, 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 bro- the brothers have re- the brothers have united. The brothers have united. And it's so wonderful that Benjamin and Joseph, who are both sons of Rachel, have united. And we're wondering how we're, we're, one, we're just rejoicing at their, at their reunification. But you know what? There's more taking place here. If, if all that took place were the re- reuniting of two brothers, I do not believe that Moses would have documented it. But because he documented it, it means that there's a prophecy here. And that means this is an event that's going to that's gonna play again in the future. So notice that Joseph weeps on the neck of Benjamin, and Benjamin weeps upon the neck of Joseph. This is another prophecy that will be fulfilled in the future. For example, and this is so appropriate for this three-week period, counting from the 17th of Tammuz to the ninth day of Av, during these three weeks of mourning. When Joseph wept upon Benjamin's neck, Joseph was mourning, he was weeping, because he prophetically saw that there will be a tabernacle, a temple on Benjamin's uh, uh, land in the future that will be destroyed. And Benjamin wept on Joseph's neck because he knew that the, temp- that the tabernacle in Shiloh will be destroyed on, within his territory in the future. So they were weeping over the destruction of the future tabernacles and future temples in Israel. You all see that? Yes. So as you see this, the entire Torah is a word about end times, about what's going to take place in the end of days, because the expectation of the coming of Messiah began in the garden. And in fact, the rabbinic commentaries tell us that if Adam and Eve would have remained faithful for just a few more hours, just a few more hours, they would have ushered in the coming of Messiah. But because they sinned, the, the coming of Messiah was delayed. So, so this, and do you remember the struggle with, with, with Jacob and, and his, his two wives, Leah and Rachel? They, all, they, they knew prophetically that they were gonna, they were gonna birth the, all the tribes of Israel. And they knew that the Messiah was going to come through the bloodline of, of, of um, you know, we're going to come through Jacob's seed. So that there's been these messianic expectations. Some weeks ago, we were studying about Ruth and Naomi. And it was known that through Boaz's bloodline, through that bloodline would come the future Messiah. And so, and even today, we are expecting the coming of Messiah. And even in this COVID-19 situation that we're in right now, I really believe that the coming of Messiah is being accelerated. Now, mm-hmm. none of us know the day, the hour. We don't, we don't know when he's coming. You know, it could be any moment. It could take place during our, our conference call here this evening. We don't know when he's coming back, but we know he's coming very soon. And I believe with, with, my, with all of my heart, it's going to take place during our life, lifetimes. So, uh, so I'm really, I'm really excited and anticipating the coming of Messiah. Amen. You know, and I want you to imagine if you knew when when Messiah was coming, what do you think that would be a good thing? I don't think so. Let's say you knew Messiah was coming on December twentieth, two thousand twenty. Are you going to spend all the time from now until December 20th living right? Some of us would be, but you know what? Some of us would take the liberty and say, I'm going to live it up until December 18th, 
then I'm going to repent on December 19th, and, and I'll, then I'll know I'll be ready for the coming of Messiah on <laughs> December 20th. See, that's the danger in knowing when he's going to come. Yes. So it's better that we don't know and we're, we keep anticipating his coming and we, and we try to live each day of our lives living the best way that we can and, and, and just expect him to come. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord, Lord and Savior, I invite you to invite him into your life even right now. That Lord Jesus, I know, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. And, and, and if you yeah. pray that prayer, prayer, you, you, you have become born again. It's, it's that simple. But, that, but our walk with God does not stop there because we, 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 there are things that we must work out and we must develop our relationship with God. And we must allow God to refine our character and that we must learn about sacrifice. We must learn how to surrender our lives to God and offer our lives to God as a living sacrifice. Amen? Yes. The next thing I want to share with you about is Israel being the apple of God's eye. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you what that means. In Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8, and Zechariah is very significant in understanding biblical prophecy, especially the end of days. Zechariah 2, 8 says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he has touched the apple of his eye. See, that is that is a that is a Hebrew idiom, and and, and is God is speaking about the centrality of Israel. And whenever any nation, any people does harm to Israel, they become God's enemy. Israel has a very special place in 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 god's heart god loves all people god created all peoples gentile and jew we're, 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 we're all god's people but israel has a very special place and the reason is before god gave the torah to israel god presented the torah to all the nations of the world and every nation of the world said no this is too difficult they rejected the torah but it was only Israel that accepted the Torah, and that was through Abraham. They accepted the, the yoke of heaven upon themselves. And that is why the Israelites were chosen to become God's chosen people. It doesn't mean that God has favorites. It's just a special place that God has given Israel. And what many Christians have done is, in a sense, they become anti-Semitic without knowing it. And, and, and they teach a replacement th theology, thinking that the church replaces Israel. And, and that, that, that is so far from the truth. The church does not replace Israel. And I'll explain that to you in just a moment. There's a very special place that Israel has in God's plan for end times. So, it, so Israel, it, I mean, all, all the promises that God has made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are going to come to pass. They're, they're all going to come to pass. Amen. So, so I, just, I just want you, to, I, I want, I want you all to know that. I want you all to know that, that we're... Israel is, they have, they have such a special place with, with the Lord. So, so there's a very special place. And I, and I, and I, I, I apologize. I, I apologize. I, I keep, I keep repeating that, but I just want you to know that we, we cannot, we can, we cannot just take a, a syringe and extract all the Jewish DNA out of the Bible. The Bible is a Jewish book. It was written by Jewish authors and salvation is for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. Amen. So I want you to know the centrality of Israel, the apple of God's eye and all the prophecies that you read in the Bible, whenever it talks about from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west, it, they're all spoken in, in, from the perspective of where Israel is. So when you speak about, speak about north of Israel, it could, it could refer to Babylon, to Iraq. When it speaks about, you know, so, so we're speaking about the different directions from Israel. So we, we, we often read the Bible and we think of the north. We think about well, what's north of America. We think of Canada. No, the, the Bible is not speaking about Canada. It's speaking about the nations north of Israel. So we need, so when, when you read the Bible, I encourage you to, to, to also bring up the biblical maps and, and see how the nations sit with relation to Israel. And know the centrality of Israel and, and, and where Israel fits in. Now, I said earlier, salvation is for the Jew first. Romans 1.16 says, and this is Paul, the Apostle Paul speaking, 
for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Do you all see that? For the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, I don't know if we have any Greeks on the line tonight, but I, I want to explain to you what Paul means when he wrote this. What he is saying is salvation is for the Jew first, those that are the descendants of, of, of Jacob. And oh, then yeah, it's yeah. for the Greek. Oh, you're kidding. But the, the Greek is the, the Greek is it refers to all the non-Jews. The Greek is 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 the, is the non-Jew. Make sense? So, and I'll and I'll prove that to you through other scriptures. And I also want to explain to you that Jesus is first the Jewish Messiah before he is the Messiah of the of the entire world. Make sense? He's the Messiah of the Jewish. He's the Jewish Messiah first. Then he's the Messiah of the entire world. And I'll give you an example of how when Jesus came in his earthly ministry for three and a half years, his ministry was not to the Gentiles. His ministry was to the Jewish population. He was sent to the lost tribes of Israel. Look at Matthew chapter 15, verse 22 through 28. We see very few instances where Jesus heals or delivers Gentiles. He, he, does, you know, he does from time to time, but his primary ministry is to the, to the Jews. Look at Matthew 15, verse 22. And it, and it reads, And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and cried, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely possessed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying after us. He answered, I was sent only to the, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. See, we think Jesus is being very cruel here. But you know what? Jesus is not being cruel. Jesus is, is, is behaving in a way that was characteristic of, of, of the rabbis. And sometimes Jesus will appear to ignore you, but he's not ignoring you. He, he, he's trying to, to develop you spiritually, and, and he's trying to develop an, a, a, an attribute in you where you'll, you'll draw close to him and that you'll hunger more for him. Amen? I mean, imagine if God answered all of your prayers at the very instant that you made the request. You know, you would, you would never grow. But there are times where God will hide his presence from us to cause us to seek after him more, uh, you know, more intently, with more fervor. And that's what God was doing. That's what God the Son, that's what Jesus was doing with, with this woman, with this Canaanite woman. He, he, was, he was allowing her faith to even develop even more and to be more fervent in her, in her request. And sometimes you've got to get on your face before God and cry out to him. Sometimes you have to fast. Sometimes you, you've got to give things up, even turn the plate over and, 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 and really give your, your sacrificial time to God. Because some, some things are, are only going to be birthed through sacrifice. Amen? You know, for those of you that haven't heard me say this before, one of my favorite books is called Reese Howe Intercessor. It's a book that Dr. Corral introduced um, us to uh, some years ago. And that is the most incredible book I've ever read on intercession. And I'll give you an example. There was a time in India where the widows were being denied social security and they, and they were not being taken care of by the government. So God put the burden upon Reese Howe that he was going to fast, he was going to intercede for the widows of India until the widows receive what they should receive with, social, with the equivalent of our social security. And you know what he did? He ate just the way the widows ate. And I believe that was, I believe it was only one bowl of rice per day or every other day. I forget what the fast was, but he consecrated and lived and ate the way the widows of India, the way the widows of India were living. Can you, that is the greatest form of intercession. When you, when you take upon yourself or you allow the Holy Spirit to give you the burden of those that you, that you are to pray for. 
I mean, study the life of Mother Teresa and look at the sacrificial way that she lived her life. Her life was a life of intercession for India. And I'm telling you, because of her sacrifice and her labor, I mean, there were so many Hindus at her funeral, so many that honored her, her life because she, she, uh, because she lived just like them. She dressed just like them. And, 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 and I encourage all of you to allow the Spirit of God to give you burdens. I encourage, I'm asking the Holy Spirit even now to give all of us uh, on this call a burden for America, to really take on the burden for America. Because I do not like the way America appears to be going. And it almost looks like America is moving into a state of an anarchy. And my prayer is yeah. that we are going to return to God wholeheartedly. Amen. That we return to him, that we love him, and that we just live lives that, uh, uh, that worthy of our calling in Christ Jesus. Amen. And I'm telling you, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to share God's word with you. And I want to share something here in Matthew chapter 15. And so, you know, Jesus says, I was only sent to the, to the lost sheep of Israel. So this Canaanite woman, she understands that. She knew that Jesus' prime ministry was to the Jews. But you know what she says? She, she, she pushes in. She presses in. And she says, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, I don't want you to translate this in, in, in an American sense. You need to understand rabbinic idioms to understand what, Ju what Jesus was saying. And so when, when he says it's not fair to take the children's bread, he's saying it's not fair that I take that which is given to Israel, to the Jewish people, and cast it to the Gentiles. Does that make sense? There's also another verse in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in the parables of Jesus where it says, do not cast pearls before swine. And the meaning of that parable is that you don't take that which is holy and give it to those that are not ready for it. But I, we cannot give the deep revelation of God's word to those that will not appreciate it. And that's what Jesus is saying here. And then the woman demonstrates tremendous faith when she says, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And then she, what, she, what she demonstrates is that she goes, I know that this word is for the Jews but let me receive the crumbs. Let me receive the crumbs. And Jesus answered her and Jesus honors her and says, "A woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Isn't that awesome? You see the humility that she's demonstrating? Tremendous, tremendous humility here. And I encourage all of you to, to have this humility. And not to lord yourself over others, but just, just to humble yourself. And salvation is for the Jews first. You know, I'm telling you, I have so much respect, so much honor for all the Jews throughout the ages. That they kept the Torah in the midst of the Holocaust, through all the persecutions that have taken place throughout the ages. They have kept their word. And because they have kept their Torah, we, have the, we are recipients of the Torah too. Amen. So I'm just so I'm so grateful. And Jesus has not forsaken the Jewish people. There will become a day that the blinders will be taken off and they will embrace their Jewish Messiah. Amen. I'll give you another example of where it shows salvation is for the Jews first. Let's look at Acts chapter 17, verse 1, verses 16 and 17. Acts 17, 1, 16 and 17. And this is where we see Paul preaching in the synagogues. And it reads, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Verse 16. See, we, before 16, we see, where does Paul go first? He goes to the synagogue. He goes to the place of, of, of Jewish worship. He goes to the place where the, Jew, the Jews gathered. And then later on in verse 16, he was in Athens, and his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who chanced to be there. See what Paul is doing here? He first preaches to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. 
salvation is for the Jew first and then for the for the Gentile. All of us being uh, all of us that are on the line that are that are not that are not Jews will fall into the category of the Gentiles. But because of Christ Jesus, we are grafted into the vine. But we must understand that salvation is for the Jew first. And if you're with, if you can, if you're with me here, uh, please say amen or, or type amen on the screen. So we need to have the understanding if we want to understand biblical prophecy and especially about the end of days. Now, the next question I'm going to ask you is, when will Messiah come? When will Messiah come? Well, the answer to that is found in Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 through 44. Matthew 24, starting in verse 32. And this is what Jesus says. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away, but my word will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows. See, no one knows the day and hour of Messiah's return, but only the Father only. Verse 37, as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one is taken, one is left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one is taken, one is left. Watch therefore, for you do not know, for you do not know on what day that your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the householder had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have watched and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you, must, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. See, during the days of Noah, the people did not know the, the day or the time the flood was happening, but only Noah and his sons and his family were ready for it. How do we know the end is near? How do we know that we're, that we're in the end of days? You know it from verse 32. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know summer is near. So also when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. I want you to know that we are at the very gates of the returning of the Messiah. The lesson from the fig tree or the branch putting on its leaves is a, is a prophecy. And the prophecy is when the, me, the meaning of the fig tree putting on leaves is a prophecy of Israel becoming a nation. See, Israel did not become an independent nation until 1948. When Jesus walked upon the earth, Israel was not an, an independent nation. It was an exile. It did not become a nation until 1948. And what Jesus is saying, when, it, when Israel becomes a nation again, that is the sign of the end of the days. And that is the generation in which Messiah will return. And guess what? I mean, for some of you in this line, Israel became a nation within your lifetime. And I'm telling you, this is, I mean, the Jews could never imagine 2,000 years without having their own nation. And look what God did suddenly in 1948. Israel achieved statehood. So I want you to know that we, we are in the, end of, in the end of days, and Messiah is coming very, very soon. And the rapture is going to take place very soon. For those of you that don't believe in the rapture, Look at verse 40 from what, what we just read, verse 40 and 41. Two men in the field, one is taken, one is left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one is taken, one is left. So that teaches us there's going to be a catching away. There is going to be a rapture. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those of, of, of us that are alive, that are believers, will be caught up in the sky to meet Christ Jesus. And, that, and I'll give that teaching in the upcoming weeks as well. 
But the key is verse 44, we must be ready. And I encourage all of you during this season to get your lives right, to repent to the best of your ability, to forgive those that have hurt you, and to love God like you've never loved God before. And allow God to use you. Allow God to, to use you in, in, in the most incredible ways. I'm telling you, God is on the throne and he is coming back for his bride. I want, I, you know, I, I'll, I wish I could have you all just raise your hand here. I, actually, I can ask some of you to do, do that here that are joining me on Zoom tonight. But I, I, I want the brides to think about how excited you, you were about your marriage day. For those of you that, that are, are, are married or have been married, I mean, the anticipation you had for that marriage day and all the planning that, that it took for, for, for that marriage day and all the expectation that you had for your marriage day. And every single detail, the dress, the, the bridesmaid, every single detail was planned out. Every, I mean, there wasn't a thing that you missed. Now, if you put that much effort into your marriage, how much, I mean, shouldn't you put at least that much attention into your relationship with Jesus? I mean, he is our bridegroom. And I'm telling you, when we meet him in the sky, and it's lovely, thank you for raising your hand there. When, when we meet him in the sky, I'm telling you what a glorious day it's going to be. Not only are we going to receive new bodies, we're going to receive new robes, and we're going to, be, and we're going to join our bridegroom in the city of Christ Jesus. And how do you prepare yourself for the coming of Messiah? You know, it's not by going out and buying the new dresses and new suits, but it's about refining your character. Because in the Hebraic sense, Sometimes putting on midot, or it can also mean clothing, is that you put on godly character traits. That means you put on loving kindness. You put on forgiveness. You put on selflessness. You, you put on character worthy of your calling. Because how many of you want your character to be so refined when you meet the bridegroom? You know, one of the biggest problems I've seen in marriages, and I've seen this in, even with folks that I've, I've, I've counseled from time to time, is sometimes people will get into marriage and knowing the flaws of their partner, but they think, well, I'll, I'll fix him or I'll fix her in marriage. And you know what, really, I don't think we should marry somebody so that we can fix them later. We need to fix ourselves before we enter into the marriage covenant, right? And even before we enter into our marriage with, with Jesus, that we, we, and actually before we meet him in the sky, before the rapture, let us really refine our character. And Lord, I want to be a worthy bride for you. I want to be a vessel that would, that's worthy, worthy to be called your bride. I want to be a vessel, Lord God, that you, you are going to be so pleased with. And Lord, if there be any ungodly way in me, Lord God, I just ask you right now, Lord God, that you just correct those character flaws that I'm walking in. If I'm bitter, if I'm angry, if I'm selfish, um, if, I, if I'm not willing to lay down my life for my brother or my sister, Lord, I ask you to give me the grace to become more yielded to your spirit. In Jesus' holy name, amen. And the one thing I want to, the question about when is the end of days? The end of days will take place when Israel becomes a nation. So the very first time this could have taken place in history is 1948. And we are living in, the very, in, in these very last days. Now, when is the very last date that Messiah can return? The very last day that Messiah can return, or the very last year in which Messiah can return, is the year 6,000. On the Hebrew calendar, we are in the year 5780. That means it has been 5,780 years since the creation of Adam and Eve. The earth, the uni I mean, the entire universe is at least 13, 14, 15 billion years old. But mankind has been on the earth for less than, less than 6,000 years. And, and to be exact, 5,780 years. So Messiah will, will return by the year 6,000. But God is going to accelerate his coming if the people have been found worthy. And that means if we perform acts of loving kindness, if we live our lives worthy of our calling in Christ Jesus, we will accelerate the coming of Messiah. And I truly believe it's going to happen very soon. It could be any day now. Amen? 
and I don't know the hour, and there's no way I'll even, even try to figure it out because only God the Father knows. That's right. Amen. Now, when will w w when will Messiah come? Actually, what will take place when Messiah comes? There'll be no more war. And you can see that in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Can you imagine living in a world where there's no more war? I don't think we could even imagine it, but when Messiah comes, there will be no more war. And I'm going to stop here. There's so much I had planned to share with you tonight. Sister Jamila, the scriptures I've shared with you will continue on from those next next Monday evening. Um, but I I I I I I hope I I hope I whet your appetite enough to where you want to come back next time. I pray that this really ministered to you because I really want to lay a very solid foundation before we continue because we we really need to understand the Jewish people as the apple of God's eye. And to know that God has not forsaken his people Israel. And I'll give you an example. Do you remember when Joseph revealed himself to his brothers? You know what he did? And I, and I, and I talk about this in detail um, in my book, The, um, the Final Countdown. Um, I, before Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, he sent all the Egyptians out of the room. And then he wept aloud and revealed himself to his brothers in secret because he did not want to humiliate his, his, his brothers. He did it in the most respectful way and revealed himself to them. I believe Christ Jesus is gonna reveal himself to the Jews in a similar manner. And I believe the Egyptians represent us non-Jewish non believers. So I think maybe a majority of us on this, on this call tonight are, 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 are non-Jewish. So we are, represent the, Egypt, the Egyptians that Joseph sent out of the room. And I believe that represents the coming of the rapture. And I believe at the time after the rapture takes place, then Christ Jesus, the Messiah, is going to reveal himself to the Jewish people. He's not going to put them to shame. I believe we're going to be taken out of the way before he reveals himself to the Jewish people. Another thing, uh, so because the way Jesus deals with us, us is with so much okay. love and kindness. You know, God does not openly humiliate us if we're living in sin. He will send prophets to us, and he will deal with us in private first. <laughs> right? He will he'll deal with us in the, mo in, 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 the, in, the, in the most kind way. In the most, because he doesn't, God doesn't want to shame any one of us. And he's so kind, he's so considerate, he's so loving. And we all struggle with different sins. Every one of us has different things that we struggle with, things that we're ashamed of. But you know what? God knows our dispositions. He knows our disposition. He knows our weaknesses. But you know what? He wants to help us through our infirmities. And he can identify with us. And he will cleanse us with his own blood. 